Hi, welcome to church. Look at that. Look at that interaction that we had. Um, I'm Kyle. I think we've all met. And, you know, if you feel like you need a refresher on what my middle name is or something like that, um, then we, we can have that conversation. Well, today we are, what, like a week, two weeks away from the end of August-ish? Ish? Okay, so I just want to be the, I saw some, I know that there was hail that took place, um, so leaves were falling, but I also saw some leaves that were yellow, and they were also, you know, being pulled by gravity or however gravity works, I don't know, the mystery is a universe, or the universe is a mystery, oof. Either way, this is my point. For some of us, this creates like a, a tightening of our chest because what we realize is that the heat of the summer that we love is slowly fading away. And yet for others of us, uh, it, it, this creates some sort of, um, I don't know, it's like pleasure stacking. We are waiting. You have like your fall wardrobe on the rack. You are waiting. You're like, I think what people call this is sweater weather. Um, I, I personally have enjoyed the heat of the summer. This has nothing to do with the way of Jesus and why we gather. I'm just simply sharing some, some fun factoids. I enjoy exercising in the outside and seeing like a, a, like a pool of sweat. And I'm like, yes, there is tangible evidence of my hard work. And for others, you're like, I'm walking around and there's a pool of sweat. So I'm ready for the weather to help regulate my you know, insides. Anyways, um, we're going to exalt the name of King Jesus. This is what we do as a community. And what I want to do prior to us kind of stepping into this is just give some announcements. Um, I've kind of been touching around it, but August is a fallow season. If you have a small humans in tow and they would normally be in an elementary classroom, uh, that is not taking place these next two weeks. Uh, and then we get a first Sunday, and that means all of the peoples are in this room. And then we kind of get back into a regular rhythm of the fall. And that is also going to, the second week of September, that is going to be 9-11. That may stand out in your cultural imagination for other reasons, but perhaps we can like tag on to that. So in addition to never forget, is never forget, it's going to be a group kickoff. Um, that's really not, I don't know, maybe it'll work. Anyways, we know that community is something that we can be invited into. And this is, this is how I've been thinking of community stuff in this community as of late, is we gather together. I will simply say, you will not be formed into the image of Jesus by showing up on a Sunday. I don't, I don't know if that's like the main line that you do at a Sunday gathering. This, this is where we reimagine the gospel. We, we remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. And then what we want to do is to build in these kind of micro rhythms into our life where we consistently remember who and whose we are. One of the ways that we can do this is through community. And this is all through invitation. 
And so there are a handful of folks in our community who've said they're going to make some space in their lives to host people on a regular basis. And, you, you know, if, that, if you're like, I want to do that, it's all invitation. The, the moment that we start to shift into manipulation or coercion or guilt, it becomes the opposite of the spirit of Jesus. And so I'm here to say that August is coming to a close. And as August comes to a close, that is the end of what we call fallow season, where we just kind of slow down around here. And then in the fall, we're going to create an opportunity for you to sign up. Hopefully you know what your rhythm is going to be, what, what kind of stuff is happening. And then you can curate in or just try on this intentional life together in community. We're still learning how to do this, but I want to make sure that you know this is happening. Over the next few weeks, you're going to see some of the people who are leading these groups. And then on 9-11, we're going to have a time where um, all of us, if you want, if, if you're sweet inclined, you can en enjoy a tasty treat and then like actually sign up like with your body, say yes, I will show up. And then um, because we're trying to make our yes, yes and our no, no, uh, then you actually have follow through because that's the way to do it. I know I'm preaching that to myself. So um, that's everything. Summer's coming to a close shedding of tears, but then gladness returns as we see one another face to face and the spirit is building us up together into maturity. So I've talked for too long. I'll be talking later. Uh, I'm going to pray and we're going to receive a call to worship. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you. Um, we thank you that we actually get to relinquish this illusion of control. Uh, we get to step into a space to remember uh, that because you are for us, and because you are with us through your personal presence, we can be whatever we are in this moment, and you are with us. You're not afraid of our frustration. You are not afraid of our sadness. You join us in our gladness, and so we thank you. I ask, Spirit, that you would join in the words and worship of the saints this morning, that our hearts would be inclined to you to receive this call, to ascribe worth to who you are. In your name, Jesus, not in any authority or emotion or passion that we bring, but in your name, Jesus, we pray this and say amen. So if you would stand with me to receive this call. Good morning, Gateway. My name is Whitney, and this is our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Let us join together in songs of praise. Salvation sounds a new beginning As distant hearts begin believing Redemption's bid is unrelenting Your love goes on Your love goes on When the world gives way, you cover us, cover us with your endless grace. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless the time is up for chasing shadows you gave the world a light to follow hope that shines We 
take a moment for confession and insurance, so please read this confession with me. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And our assurance comes from Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. At this time, you can take a moment to greet one another. Um, Elementary kids are in here, but there are... Activity packets, if you want one.
good start. Making your way back to your seat. All right. We're going to enter into a time of giving. And there are multiple ways you can give at Gateway if you feel so inclined. You can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can give online through our website. And there are giving envelopes and the baskets to your left that you can put in this black box up here at the front. So I'm going to read through our giving liturgy. Feel free to join me in that reading. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches that chokes the word, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Well, you know, I, I, I recently heard a story uh, about a, a mom of five who would pass houseless people on the street, and there would be these pangs of guilt that would kind of careen within her insides because she felt as though she ought to be moving toward those people, whether it be uh, attending to a, a line in a soup kitchen or maybe working at a shelter or something like that. And over a, a, a progression of a season, I don't know how long the season is for this particular person, but she felt as though the Lord was inviting her to see her children. And this might sound odd to you, but in the face of her five children, she would constantly encounter needs. She would encounter moments of, my cup has fallen and I don't know what's going to happen. My food bowl is empty. This person is annoying. They hit me on and on day and night. And, and there was a switch that took place in her imagination. And from her vantage point, it was like the spirit attending to hers, to her own spirit, was that here are the needy among you. And the reason I'm sharing that after we kind of are led through this generosity liturgy is that the way that you are generous in this community might not look like giving a check. The way that you're generous in this community might look like standing awkwardly at the door and welcoming someone. The, mayor, the way you're generous in this community might not actually be here in this building on a Sunday or in a group associated with this community. It might actually be your neighbor's dog continues to poop in your yard, and yet you, without grumbling in your heart, you pick it up. And that might sound so silly, but I guess the point in front of me and that this generosity liturgy reminds me is that, that there would be no needy person among us. Who's, who are those among us? I think we get to choose the boundary markers there. And I think that there is a direct implication on the community that's here called Gateway that we want there to indeed be no need and there is vulnerability and risk to share that need. I get all that. But perhaps there's this invitation in the regular places that we're living our lives to, to like live in the fullness of who God is asking us to be and notice the needs around us. Um, so that kind of touches on our teaching text, but so that you know where we're going, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We are just about done in the Sermon on the Mount, which um, excites me and pains me all at the same time. Uh, if I get my way after we go through this little fall vision series, we will be back in a gospel because we should never leave the gospels. If you're thinking, gosh, I've been reading through the Bible and I'm in numbers and I'm so tired of reading about they had one silver plate with this many shekels and these many, okay, just sprinkle in a little gospel and it's going to invigorate your soul. So 
That being said, this is our second to last teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. This comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or woman who built their house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. Um, so about, I don't know, four or five years ago, this would map onto 2017, 2018-ish, I came across the work, uh, not through my own investigation, but through another preacher, interestingly enough, uh, the work of an author and critic and professor named Neil Postman. And Neil Postman is the author of this work called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, if you've ever seen the work in like the actual cover art, it is a person with a TV screen. Now this is back in the 80s and so, you know, this is when TVs were called sets and it was a box or they would call it the tube because there were actual tubes in the back. They were not flat screens positioned against a wall or mounted up. They were literal boxes. Perhaps you've seen one on the side of the road that needs to be picked up. Yes, this is what's on the cover. And though, you know, Postman was writing back in the 80s, his work is uh, in some sense still prophetic. That is, it is announcing something that is turning to be true. And just listen to his hot take. The tie between information and action has been severed. Information is now a commodity that can be bought and sold, or used as a form of entertainment, or worn like a garment to enhance one's status. It comes indiscriminately, directed at no one in particular, disconnected from usefulness. We are glutted with information, drowning in information, have no control over it, don't know what to do with it. Now, there's one little part of that that you might take issue with, as I do, directed at no one in particular. Postman had no idea about algorithms. He didn't know about targeted advertising. He had no frame of reference for what, that Google would become what Google is. But what still stands is that we are overloaded with information. We are numbed, calloused to the sheer volume of quote-unquote facts that careen against our face every single day. I mean, just think about this, another shooting, another fire, another CDC warning about another global thingamajig, another, 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 do you get the point? There's always another thing coming to us, and it's not like uh, good news, it's things that kind of get into our limbic system, this place where all the stuff of like the prefrontal control, the things that were quote unquote logical, no, it activates us in our inner woman, our inner man, it elicits fear. You see, um, I, I, I was recently at this little family gathering and it was at some point in a collection of those evenings when everyone's kind of just doing their own thing. Some people are playing cards, some people are, I don't know, scrolling, other people are reading. And at one point, somebody just looks up and they start to share the news that they're reading. And they said, there was a car crash. There's fatalities. In this moment, I was one of the people playing cards and I was so frustrated. And there's layers to my frustration. Uh, at, there was one layer that was, I'm frustrated that this news outlet is going to share the death of these people to generate clicks. That's kind of thin because immediately my frustration is directed at this person like, and I'm thinking, I can do nothing about this. And as I've sat with my, I call it frustration, I was annoyed, if we're being honest. As I sat with my annoyance with my family member whom I love, I, I realized that the, the chief frustration is that I actually have no agency. This information comes to me. I cannot, like, I don't know, I guess I, I could, like, write a local legislator and then ask for them to decrease the speeds because we're continuing to buy like, and drive vehicles that are way too big for the speeds that are indicated. But that's a, not a sermon, maybe a lecture for a, that I'm not even qualified to give. 
I felt this intense absence of agency, and it was this frustration. And if you're like me, and these moments also leave you kind of, I don't know, annoyed, I, I want to just also say, you're not alone. I'm, I'm testifying to this. Um, and from your nods, I am getting some witnesses on the internet. The people in the room, they're feeling the frustration. So just know this is true. See, we, we have this, this thing that's happening in our souls. And in some sense, it's just called life. This is going somewhere. You see, I, I would be remiss if I said that the pain point of this thing, this frustration that we feel, is that we hear all of this information, but we seldom can do anything about it. As Postman says, we are glutted with information. We are weighed down with it, but seldom can we actually do anything about it. And this is the, coin, the, the, the phrase that Postman coined in response to this, and he calls it low information to action ratio. That's the angst that we feel. That's the label that he's put to our angst. We have a low information to action ratio. And following Jesus is simply incongruent with that. See, the, the way of Jesus is just that. It is a way of life. It is something to be integrated into the whole of our life. And because the way of Jesus is that, following Jesus is more than just a constellation of moral invitations or, I don't know, kind of like things that we attach, like widgets to our life. No, at its core, following Jesus is living into new life with Jesus by a power that is outside of us yet within us. In other words, it is complex and it is really simple. And that's why as we kind of wind down this series, I want to draw our attention to the single word that will more or less define the rest of our time. And that word is found in our teaching text in the first verse, in verse 24, and that word is practice. Just say that with me, practice. Now register, what comes to mind when you think of practice? Do you got it? Okay. So surely there is a progressive aspect to this word practice. I am not an, I, I don't play any instruments. Um, I will never be invited here to play instruments. I like to sing loudly. Sometimes it's just to like, because I know Josh doesn't have an in-ear monitor, so I want him to hear my voice, and I don't, um, it's a whole thing. Um, don't let me play any instruments. Griffin has a ukulele at home, and I'll play it, and he, so, he says, Daddy, stop. Like, that's the level of incompetence that I carry with an instrument. But... Hypothetically, I could practice scales. And if I practiced scales for long enough and I got the ukulele calluses on my fingers, I could maybe, maybe be permitted to like play a sample here, but probably not. The, 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 my point that I'm making here and I'm, I'm laboring it is that there is an, an aspect of practice that is incremental, progressive improvement and there's something more going on when we think about practice as well because it's more than improvement. Practice, when Jesus is talking about it, is about integration. Practice is more about integration than it is improvement. And th this is what I mean. Consider a, a profession like law. If someone is actively a lawyer, they may say, I am practicing law. Now, let's just ask, does that mean that they are getting better at the law? We hope not. No, because the law is this kind of, I don't know, compendium of procedures and, I don't know, precedents and other fancy words that we don't really know, but we trust that lawyers do. And in fact, the American Board Association, which establishes what practicing the law is, they say this, the practice of law is the application of legal principles and judgment with regard to the circumstances or objectives of a person that require the knowledge and skill of a person trained in the law. That feels like a lot, right? Just hear these first few words again. The practice of law is the application stop. In other words, this is a really long way to make the simple point that when Jesus talks about practice, he is literally, not metaphorically, but literally, not, hi not hyperbolically, literally, not hypothetically, but literally talking about integrating his teachings into our lives. This is what it is to practice the way of Jesus, to decrease the information to action ratio. You could think about the Sermon on the Mount as a whole process of decreasing information to action. See, when Jesus talks about our enemies, 
He is saying he literally, not hypothetically, wants us to move toward our enemies the way that God in Christ has moved toward us. Now, let's just ask a simple question. Um, is that easy? If we're honest, it's like, the uh, no. No, an enemy is an enemy for a reason because there's been some sort of friction between you and that person or you and that group. And that creates a barrier. But what God in Christ has done is created this buffer of love whereby we can consider our lives as really little of expense to move toward that person because we see in them something of great value. This is the type of movement that Jesus is literally inviting us into. So just hear this again in context. Practice. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus referring back to everything in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 so far. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise person who built their house on the rock. And from there onward, Jesus is going to tell this all too familiar parable about houses and sand and stones and wind and the like. But notice that when it comes to his teachings, Jesus wants them to get all the way into our life. He wants to infuse them into the nooks and crannies of our lived experience. He does not want them to sit like a slick of oil atop the surface of our lives only to be washed away. No, he wants them to get down into the warp and woof of our daily life. He wants us to integrate. And how do we integrate? We practice. In the Greek, the language that the New Testament was originally recorded in, the word for practice is this word poieo. Give that one a try. Let's just, for funsies, one more time. Poieo. It's not to be confused with poio, like chicken, but um, poieo. So, so depending on your translation, you may encounter poieo as does or acts on, or if you're, if you're rocking the King James Version, it is doeth, because old English. I like how the NIV captures it. It's what we've read. It, it is uh, to poieo Jesus' words, is to put them into practice. I hope that you feel the redundancy by now. We're belaboring this point for a reason because this is kind of the thing. <laughs> that as Jesus comes to the conclusion of these teachings in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it would be unfortunate if we have heard him and go away as those who have not. Is this making sense? I don't know, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount for like what seems like three years, but it's been like six, seven months or so. Wouldn't it be a bummer if we could sing songs about who's blessed in the kingdom? Wouldn't it be a bummer if we knew in some sense, maybe even some of you have committed to memory parts of the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and yet, though you know it, it has never and not yet gotten down into how you live. That's why Jesus, when he comes to the conclusion of his teaching, is going to end like this, to talk about poieoing, to do. You see, Jesus uses this word poieo 22 times in the Sermon on the Mount and 10 times in the outro. The outro are the teachings that we've heard in the previous weeks. This is Christy. This is Leonard. Christy talking about the narrow way. Leonard talking about the fruit that would come out. So in some sense, the, the tree that poieos or bears good fruit that this is 10 times in the outro, Jesus is employing this word. Why? To get across this overwhelming and simple point that invitation is the in, like integration is the invitation. And so I just want to slow down and I just want to ask us, um, how, like, how is it going? Doing a little introspection is actually a, like a healthy habit to integrate into our lives. It's Socrates who says, what, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I don't really know a lot of like Greek philosophy and stuff like that, but that one stuck. So a little, like, in all sincerity, are you becoming the woman or man whose life has been defined by love and grace? Are you, are you becoming that person? And I'm not bringing this with any shame, like there's not a pop quiz. This is just, so just take a moment, just survey the course of your life, a, a Monday to a Sunday, the people you work with, the job sites you're on, the students who are coming in or you're releasing unto teachers. Are you becoming more and more a person of love? 
And think about Jesus' teaching, what his invitation is, like when it comes to lust. This is true for women and men, everything in between. Like, are you being formed by love? What about materialism? Or, or how about anxiety? See, my guess is, is if you're like breathing and listening to this teaching right now, um, that you could readily name the gap between the life that you're living and the teachings of Jesus. And I just say that's normal because the call to Jesus is, of the call of Jesus is to holiness over the course of your life. It's not as though we've concluded the Sermon on the Mount and you're like, well, I only have like, I don't know, one thing. I guess I'm kind of a peacemaker, so, but the rest of it is out, so I guess I can't follow Jesus. No, that would be silly because the call of Jesus is to integrate the teachings of Jesus now and for the rest of your life. But right now, we, I'm sure we can name the gap and I know this because staying with anxiety, you know, a few months, a few weeks, month, I don't know, a number of weeks ago, we arrived at Jesus' teaching on anxiety. And as I'm preparing to teach you all and myself and learn about anxiety, I feel anxiety. I feel this, t like, am I going to, in the 33 odd years of my life, be able to say anything substantive to direct our community out of this kind of snarled nest that is anxiety? It's kind of in the air. <sighs> that was what I, like, that, that was, by the way, that, that moment, that kind of frenetic pace, like that was what was preceding me in that. And I, I just, uh, the irony of that, that in teaching on anxiety, I would feel some anxiety about that. And my, my point is simply this. Um, our lives cannot escape the breadth of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Like, it, it, to my mind, the place that we should, we would do well to come back Time and time again, week in and week out, month after month, is just the Sermon on the Mount. It takes you 25 minutes to read through those three chapters. And you know what? There's something about allowing that to be a framework, a grid of saying, this is what reality looks like. Spirit, like God, help me in the midst of this. Because I think though we are good at it, we would do well not to compartmentalize our life with Jesus. I know that we are good at it because I am pretty good at it. I spent 20 years compartmentalizing my life. And then when Jesus came into my life, he fit into the system of compartmentalization. I said, oh, I, I will be spiritual in these spaces and I will be whatever I need to be in these spaces to get by. The call of Jesus is not just the integration of his teaching in the spiritual component of your life, but in all of your life. Is this making sense? See, Jesus, Jesus isn't interested in just changing your mind. I, I don't think that Jesus is like setting out in the New Testament as a logician, not a magician, but he's not trying to make some sort of logically coherent argument to win you over to the kingdom of God. In some sense, I think that Jesus is saying, this is the invitation to life empowered by the Spirit. This is the invitation to life that's fully entrusted to God. Do you want to take part? By the way, it feels like being hung on a cross. You want in? And it's going to be the fullness of joy. This seems more like the thing. Jesus, he, Jesus wants the whole of our lives. He, he wants the, our hearts is the language that the scriptures will use because that's the center of our mind and our will and our intellect. He wants all of us, not just him compartmentalized to part of our life, but the whole thing because you can have a brilliant mind and a broken life. Jesus wants us to flourish in the wake of God's love. And how? Well, to hear his words and to put them into practice, to poieo them, to walk in wisdom. And you may have noticed this as we've worked through even just the teaching text, which we are still getting to, I promise. Um, so forgive me if this sounds obvious or redundant, but to follow the way of Jesus is at its core the sharp either or. It, it is to embrace an either or at some level. Either you are following Jesus or you are not following Jesus because when it comes to Jesus, he's saying you are either going to build your life on this type of a thing, namely the rock, his way, embodying that, or you're going to build your life on this type of a thing, namely the sand. It is either the rock or the sand. 
And believe it or not, this is kind of hard for me to receive. Uh, I am the type of person for whom rules feel flexible. Uh, oftentimes, Jessica and our partnership, we will kind of, I don't know, we'll be tag teaming. We'll also have like a screaming child who's saying, I want mama, or vice versa. And so um, we, you know, tag one another in. So in the instance where if Jessica is cooking and she asks, you know, we need to switch, she'll tag me in. And something Jessica will say to me is, follow the recipe. Why does she say follow the recipe and then enunciate it all like I'm silly? Like, she says it because I've been known from time to time to receive a recipe as a suggestion more than like a rule to follow. It says, I don't know, put a cup of that. I'm like, ah, well, I think we could do something better than what this recipe has on offer. And so when Jesus invites us into a sharp either or, I too am trying to like finagle my way between the forward slash between the either and the or. Now I know some of you may go, isn't it a backslash? Thank you, Wes. No, it is a forward slash. However, for the longest time, I thought it was a backslash. You get the point. So for me, the forward or backslash, the forward slash is like a diving board into adventure. You just, you get to dive off that thing and figure out what life is going to be. And this is what many just call nuance or complexity. And to be sure, these are two things that Jesus of Nazareth has going on. This is the living God manifest in the flesh who did not consider his equality with God as something to be grasped. Instead, he set it off. He set it aside. He emptied himself and he moves towards us now in the spirit with love. There is certainly nuance and complexity in Jesus of Nazareth. And here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is inviting us into this sharp either or. It's interesting just think back with me, because this isn't something new. It's not like Jesus is going, gotcha, <laughs> at the end. No, this is consistent. Either you will serve God or mammon. It's either treasures on earth or treasures in heaven. This is something that Jesus builds into the, the scaffolding, the framework of his teaching. Just think a couple weeks ago to Christie's teaching. It is either the narrow way or it is the wide way. One leads to life and one leads to the absence of life, what Jesus will call destruction, the disintegration of your life. It's almost like that type of life is built on something that is not solid. Or you can think of a, a tree that is either going to bear fruit that is good and nourishing or fruit that is rotten. This is something that Jesus is built into his teaching because there is no fence sitting in the kingdom of God. It's not part of the structure. And so too, in this parable, you will either construct your life upon a rock, Jesus' way in teaching, or in the face of overwhelming pressure, all that you build will be swept away. Can we at least agree that those are kind of sobering words? I mean, regardless of how you feel about this teaching so far and however you're measuring it and, I don't know, scale of good to bad teachings, like, Jesus says, it's either going to be built up and withstand or it's going to be built up and it's going to come down with a mega, like a mega, a, a great crash. I'm imagining if you're reading through the Sermon on the Mount, because let's say you've just come to trust Jesus and you're like, well, apparently this is his best offering, so I'm going to go here, and you come to the end and you're like, hold on, I either integrate his teaching or my life crumbles? By the way, this is how Jesus ends the teaching, which um, I like to go out with, I don't know, like at the end of our teaching, something that's like moving us, not emotionally manipulative, but I'm like, spirit, come on, do stir these people up who are a bit more introverted than me. Let's do this. And um, Jesus is like, no, it's either you integrate it or your life crumbles. And then it goes on. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing, Jesus? And I think this is actually part of the beauty of Jesus and his teaching. Because in this, like where I'm trying to finagle my way between the either and the or to jump off the proverbial forward slash, Jesus, Jesus is giving us clarity. J Jesus is actually saying, no, this is the invitation. Even conventional wisdom of the day gets this. Like the, the patron saint of our day, uh, Brene Brown, she talks about it like this. She says, clarity is kind. Jesus is being super clear 
And so I just want to propose to you that it is actually the kindness of Jesus to be as stark as he is in this teaching. Because again, there is no fence sitting in the kingdom. Halfway in might be all the way out. And I mean, think about it, to the hypocrite who is so religious that they can't even enjoy sin and to the compromise who cannot fully enjoy Jesus, the invitation of Jesus is extended that it is either or. Jesus in his kindness invites us to choose freely because anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise who builds, not like the fool who also builds. See, let's just hear this parable afresh. And I know that for some of you, you know this parable, like you know it really well. You know it like flannel board, felt board well. By the way, is it flannel board or felt board? Yes, okay, yeah. Um, well, you know it from those types of moments in your life. Or you just know it because it somehow has, it still has some sort of cultural resonance. You're like, oh yeah, that sounds like something Jesus would say. So just, if you will, receive this. Let these words kind of do something to your inner woman or inner man. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built their house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But... Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not poieo them is like a foolish person who built their house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And so to end our time, let's just uh, work our way through this bit by bit. To be obvious, this parable is about two builders. Any guess what they're building? A house, yes. Sometimes with parables, parable literally means to set alongside, and there is no single definition of parable that scholars on the parabolic stories of Jesus are satisfied with. Is it an analogy? Is it metaphor? Yes. There's a lot going on here. It's meant to activate our imagination. So there are two builders. They're building a house. What does the house represent? Well, let's get into it. It represents in some level the wise and the foolish because in Jesus' frame of life, wisdom and foolishness are not just moral aspects of life. They're kind of like mental maps. They give you a way to live into the world. You can live into the world as one who is wise or you can live into the world as one who is foolish. And this not only borrows from the, the actual wisdom of Jesus' day. Think Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes. But there's also, th these are the buzzwords of the day. Wise and foolish. You have the Greek philosophers who were talking about the wise life. We would talk about this as the good life. Wisdom and foolishness are the way that you talk about what does it mean to truly be alive. We say it, to live your best life. This is what Jesus is after when he's activating these buzzwords. And so I think to help this make sense, because it helped this make sense for me, let's just uh, talk about, I don't know, first century residential, residential life as you do on a Sunday morning. See, today in the late modern West, it would be rather odd to encounter a multi-generational household. If there was a household, unless it's like a, a family from whom they come, like a, um, generally in our context, it's an immigrant family. But if you were to encounter a, a family where it's Grandma and Grandpa, Mom and Dad, and then the grandchildren, they're all there in the same house, but they kind of, I don't know, they share suites. The, the one time you see this is like there's a mother-in-law suite, which is for those who've been fortunate to make money to be able to build those things. I think that's great. I would love one of those, but, you know, we live like in a little cottage, so that's not happening. Uh, that would be kind of a way you would see it, but in Jesus' day, it would actually be really odd to see a single family home. Like that would be like, what's, what's going on? Are those lepers? Is that what's going on? They need to be separated from community? Because it's all about being joined together. And so Jesus is talking about building a house. So what does it mean in the first century to build a house? Well, a home is the place where you not only, it's not like where you're like, oh, I'm going to go home. I'm going to relax. 
Maybe relaxation means a book and some tea. Maybe you're like, oh, I'm going to watch some Netflix. This, no, that's not what Jesus is talking about. No, it is a place of vocation. It's the place where you are contributing to the good of your community. It's the place of civic and civil and work life, even religious life, comes to bear on the home. To talk about the construction of a home in Jesus' day and in this parable is to talk about the full composition of your life, not the compartmentalized religious part of your life. In other words, this parable is getting at you and me in this side, through the side door to say, what is, how do you compose the whole of your life? Well, however you think about that, that's where Jesus is inviting us. And just to, to go a, a little bit further into this, you see, Jesus is going to pick up on this imagery elsewhere in the New Testament, specifically in the gospel according to John, and he's going to talk about going to prepare a place for us. Isn't that kind of weird language? Maybe. Um, but for Jesus, it's normal language. This is bridegroom and bride language. The, the, the bridegroom would be betrothed. That is the, the, the troth. They would entrust themselves to one another. And this arrangement would be far more intense than our engagements that we see today that can happen and then be broken off and then come back together or whatever that looks like. No, it's essentially like I am going to prepare a home. So the, the bridegroom would go back to his ancestral land, the, his father's house, and he would build either an, a structure onto the existing structure, and that would be their new home. That is where they would live and raise a family and contribute to the good of the community. And then when it was ready, he would go back to the bride who's been preparing herself. You see, this, this context is important because we all have a home. The wise has a home. The foolish has a home. The difference is the foundation. And, and what's important, at least as we're, we're coming to this imagery, is remember Jerusalem is in the desert. So this is an arid environment. So when Jesus starts talking about the storm, there would be these things called flash floods. You think if the ground is hard and unable to absorb the water that's flowing, if you live in a ravine or a valley, what's called a wadi, the, there would be a flash flood. And if you had built your home near one of these structures, they would be washed away. So when Jesus is talking about this, there is, you, you have to imagine that people have the imagery in their mind. They know what this looks like because it's not if the flood comes, but when. The people with whom Jesus is speaking, they have the imagery of a home that has been swept away, the life of a person that has vanished in the wake of a storm. And it's not if, but when the storm comes. And you see, what, what's so curious is when Jesus talks about this as the wise and the foolish are both building a house, he doesn't, he doesn't give all the details. This is the beautiful thing of parables. See, when Jesus says that the wise person hears and does his teaching, but the fool does not, he doesn't say why. Maybe it's a stage of life thing. I don't know. Maybe it's just like she's building her career, and so the way of Jesus is incongruent with that. She just has to hustle harder. Or maybe it's just he's like, you know, the kids are crazy right now. Or I, like my friends are all in this stage of life where I want to have some mobility. Or I, like... I don't know, anxiety is too intense. Like Jesus does not say why. Instead, he allows us to see ourselves into the story. Did you know that this is the invitation of the scriptures? Not just for you to read it and then like blindly apply it, but for you to read it and to come to life and to question it and wrestle with it and, and grapple in community with it and go, hold on a second, like what type of life am I constructing? Because this is the question that comes to you. Are you the fool? Or are you wise? So somebody asks you, yeah, how was your weekend? Oh, I was just, I've been wrestling with the question, you know, am I the fool? Are you foolish? Do you ever think about that? I mean, this is what Jesus is essentially bringing us to. The sobriety of Jesus' teachings, if we're willing to receive them, they are a gift. Because it's not if, but when the flood comes and the difference is solely the foundation See, the words of, of, of Jesus, I, I think, have the potency to wake us up. At least that's what I've been experiencing as of late. See, we, when we went on vacation uh, a few weeks back, we went to Michigan. 
And we have, I don't, we went in northern Michigan. There's lots of big bodies of water up there. And we have some friends who have done really well in life. And they invite us just to stay in their homes. For us to go from a little cottage to like, like having a bathroom, your own bathroom, feels like opulent wealth. It's like, hold on a second. This is amazing. I can use the restroom. No one's interrupting. Yes and amen. This is great. And in those spaces, we, we were able to encounter, I was like walking to the beach. There's actual beaches in the Midwest. It's called Lake Michigan. If you've not gone, um, go for it. It's a blasty. But I'm, I'm like blocks away, walking to the beach. And you know what I, I, I do find myself doing in those moments? I'm going on a realtor. I'm going on, what's, what's the other one? Zillow. I'm like, oh my, oh, 1.6 mi- I could, okay, what do we need to do? Like, all of a sudden, I'm calculating in my mind how it is to, like, for our family to pool all of our resources to be able to be in this space. There's something about, I'm like, I'm re-architecting my life in order to enjoy that type of relaxation. I was there for four days. Jesus knows that there's something in us, something in the human condition that wants rest, that wants that deep soul level affirmation. What what Jesus had spoken over him before he did anything, that word of beloved. There's something in our inner woman or inner man that craves for the word of beloved to be spoken over us. And Jesus, to my mind, is saying, yes, there is a place where you can be reminded of that day in and day out. And it is the integration of my teachings into the whole of your life. And that might sound really odd to think, hold on, I'm going to be reminded of my belovedness as I love my enemy, as I pick up my neighbor's dog poop again? Yeah, it's actually that simple. The, the, the person who sits in the cubicle next to you who is really annoying, or maybe you're the annoying person, like, it is this simple to move toward them with love. That is the integration of Jesus' teaching. That's the beauty of it. And over time, this maturation, we start to become the people we desire to live with, people of love. That is Jesus' end. See, as the saying goes, character is destiny, that you are becoming right now who you will be. So just plot this out. See, the reason I asked us earlier on, like, how's it going, is not to, again, elicit shame, but because I want us to start thinking, who am I going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years If your life stays on the course that it is right now, without any sort of augmentation, who are you? Now just forecast a little bit further. You, your hair, if you're me, is all gone. Your body, a bit more decrepit. We're all dying right now. Welcome to church. Um, Like, so, so who are you? Jesus is kind of asking this question when he's talking about the home that you're building. Because it's going to be built, but the foundation, it's not the type of materials. It's the foundation. It's not, did you get the right permits? No, it is the foundation. It is the foundation alone. And what is the foundation? It is his words and his way. It's the identity we received, beloved son, and the vocation we are called into to live into the way of love. So this is where the what if questions come to my mind as we close. What if we actually did it? Bit by bit, we evaluated, just did like a little intake and went, oof, or this is encouraging. And then slowly and incrementally, we just invited the spirit to wake up the love for our enemy. And I'm only using that one because it's like thematic in the teaching. I'm just trying to get it into our minds that this is something we can actually do by the power of the Holy Spirit. A couple of the people in this community, one in particular who I just looked at and this came to my mind, um, he had this opportunity uh, to have a conversation with somebody who he described as his enemy. This was a person who he's had, I don't know, some like passive aggressive interactions with and uh, essentially like most of life in 2022. And then there was like a conversation that was a vague, I want you to come into my office. This is his boss. And throughout this time, we've just been connecting and asking like, what does it look like to pray for your enemy and doing all of this? And, And the testimony that he shared is actually having a softening, like empathy in his heart toward this person 
reminded me that this is actually possible. This is not pie in the sky kind of stuff. This is day in, day out kind of things. So are we wise or are we foolish? This is the question that you get to ask yourself as you leave. Like, and that's not the end of the sentence, your response. Yes, I am foolish. Yes, I'm wise. It's actually a bit of both all the time moving toward wisdom, I'm hearing the call of Lady Wisdom to receive it, or I'm choosing my own way and moving toward foolishness or folly. This is a, we're a bit of a mixed bag all of the time, and by God's grace, through the personal presence of the Spirit, we are slowly and surely becoming the people that we want to be in Christ. So right now, the character that you have is setting a trajectory for who you will be. And Jesus, this morning, can we all just like, whatever you're doing, just draw in here as we close. Jesus is inviting each and every one of you to hear his call to integrate his teaching into his life because he wants you to become, and he knows that you can become a person of love. And how that will manifest looks totally different. By the way, vocational ministry is not the ideal. I get to like preach sermons and I'm, gr I'm so, gr this, I have the bl a blast. Can you tell? Anyways, I have a blast. This is so, I get to pray with people and meet with people and talk about random stuff. It is amazing. But you know where the kingdom of God shows up? It shows up in your life. It shows up in the classroom with the kids that you're working with. It shows up in the random shops that you go to. It shows up in your cubicles. It shows up in your like slack conversations. That's where the kingdom of God is breaking in. Not like here. This is for us to remember the goodness of God, to preach that and prophesy that over one another. This is the place where we remember that is where we live it. Jesus' hope for us to integrate his teachings are not so that we could come to the 2022 version of synagogue and then say, look how good we're doing, Jesus. No, Jesus' invitation to integrate it is so that the world might experience the love of Jesus at no cost. This is where we say amen. Amen, because this is where we actually practice it. If you would, stand with me. See, um, all of these teachings are moving toward one end. And that is toward remembering Jesus. If we are going to hear the word, we actually want to respond to the word. That's why we worship in response. That's why we take the bread and the cup. And so if you want, I, I have the, I don't know, confidence that Jesus has opened his table to you. To, to your left, if you're up here, or to your right over here, there are these little cups with the, the elements, the, the juice and the bread. And... We come to this time, we, we come to the table to remember the goodness of God on offer in Jesus of Nazareth, that there is in Christ another way forward. And it may sound cliche and ridiculous and silly to say that way forward is love, but it's not cliche, it's not silly, it's not ridiculous if it's true. If it's true, it's worth a response. And if it's worth a response, then it's worth you actually having shown up here today. And I have the confidence that it actually is worth you being here to remember that God in Christ loves you. He is for you. He has spoken his belovedness over you. And however it is that you choose to encounter that and receive it, that is to you. Jesus seldom, if ever, is going to pry open the door and say, let me in. No, Jesus is going to knock, he's going to beckon, he's going to call, and he will not stop. He won't. That's the confidence that I have. I primarily do not have confidence in Jesus because of the scriptures, and maybe that sounds weird coming from somebody who's just teaching from the scriptures. I have confidence in Jesus because I have encountered the living Jesus through the love of you, through the love of my neighbor, and through the personal presence of Jesus. And one of the ways that it has been particularly mediated in my life is the bread and the cup. And so I just invite you. I'm gonna pray over you, over the elements. I'm gonna invite you to take the bread and the cup as a place of tangible, tangible encounter. And then I invite you to respond in song. Sometimes we need to mark a moment, like, I don't know, maybe this is just for one person here this morning, that you need to mark this moment to say, yes, I do want to do this, and I need Jesus' help. Maybe that moment means you coming up here and, like, praying. Maybe it means figuring out a way to, like, bow down on these <laughs> bleachers. Or maybe it's just saying yes again to Jesus and taking the bread and the cup. 
So let me pray. Let us take the elements and let us respond in worship. Father, we, we just say you are all we need. We thank you that you, through Christ, have, have actually made this way forward in love possible that you have demonstrated love. You, we can love because you have first loved us. And so we say yes again to your love. We say yes to your love, Jesus. We receive it in. And so as we take the body broken, the blood poured out, the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins, we affirm that that is the words you've spoken over us. As you are forgiven, you are loved, you are my daughter, my son, in whom I am pleased. And would we, in this time, respond as who we truly are? Would we, would we remember no more the lies that tell us we are less than the beloved of God? So church, would we respond as who we truly are in Christ? Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with the precious Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, what a 
Christ is risen Bow down before Him For He is Lord of all Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Our Father who in heaven reigns How great and mighty is your name Your kingdom come, your will be done Now here on earth as it is Oh, give to us our daily bread And keep our hungry spirits fed May all our satisfaction be In you whose grace has set us free Give us hope Faith, help us trust in your guidance from the depths of your grace. You have richly provided. Thank you, thank you, Father. You are all we need. Father, you. As we forgive when sinned against Though evil seeks to hide your face We fix our eyes on you by faith Give us hope, give us faith Help us trust in your guidance from the of your grace you have richly provided thank you thank you father you are all we need give us hope give us faith help us trust in your God.
from Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Together as we walk through this way. 